I'm just trying to find the, uh, I, I love to, you know, you know, when I do the Sunday morning messages and um, Sam, Sam said to me, he said, why, why, when there's nobody in the congregation, why are you looking around? <laughs> you know, well, that's a really good observation. And I said, because I see you all there, see you all there, even if you're not there. And it's, it's quite disturbing actually preaching to a whole load of empty seats. Now I don't have to, Tiana. Praise God for that. Okay, I want to um, just read a passage of scripture. This, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? I, I honestly believe that the problem with the church today is that we are not representing Jesus Christ as we should. And as, as untasteful as you might find that, we have to concede that it is the truth. It is the truth. When you look back at the, um, the day of Pentecost in the, the New Testament time, they, they gathered daily to study the scriptures. You know, the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Do we do that? Are we students of the Bible? Do we take the Bible seriously? Because it is God's word. You know, that song we just sang, he's coming again, and he, it, it says he comes back as the word you know in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God so the word of God is absolutely crucial for us in order to build a relationship with Jesus Christ it tells us here in 2nd Peter chapter 3 1 to 11 Peter writes beloved I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget now, make note of that. You remember that passage of Scripture in Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6? People perish because of lack of knowledge. Yeah? Because of lack of knowledge, my people are perishing. And he, it goes on in the next line to say, because you, because you have rejected knowledge. You have rejected it. You've got it, but you reject it. And this is the similar sort of thing that he's saying here, that many scoffers will come in the last day walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? And I don't think he's talking about unregenerated people there. I think he's talking about professing Christians. He's talking about, he's got no reason to expect the, the pagans or the unsaved to, um, to believe in Jesus coming back again. So he's talking to believers here. He says, they walk according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Why? We know that it was because there was only eight people found righteous at that time. And God saw that the evil and the wickedness was rampant on the face of the earth, and he destroyed it. But he kept those eight righteous people to keep populating the earth. In verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, Colossians 1.12, in him all things consist. In the Greek, it's literally all things hold together by the word of God, even today. If we were to take the word of God away, the whole of existence would disappear because everything is held together by the word of God. 
but the heavens and earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. Now, when, when I see things like that, take notice. What is he going to say? But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In other words, suddenly, when you least expect him, when you're not prepared. You know, when you go to bed at night, do we take much notice of the fact that somebody could break into our house? No, if you knew a thief was coming, you'd be prepared. But we don't know when the Lord's coming back. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So he's telling us this is what's going to happen. And therefore, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? I don't think that's difficult. Anybody think that's difficult to understand? It's very difficult. It's, it's very difficult. Very simple to understand. Be found by him, obedient, serving him, being a light to the, the nation. We have to be Christ to our generation. You know, and I, what's going on in the world today, the church has been ripped apart. Everything has been ripped apart by division, um, dissension, and it's very difficult to see the church of Jesus Christ in, in its glory. You know, we should be demonstrating the power of God. I really, be, I really feel God's been putting this on, on my heart of late. We, we have to learn how to demonstrate the power of God. And so we, we have to believe him for healing, for miracles. We live in a supernatural dimension, not a, a physical dimension. So bearing in this, in this in mind, when, when you look at what Peter has said here, he said there's lots of things going on. He said the people will be rebuking you and making fun of you and continuing as if they had never heard the word of God. If we, if we are hearers of the word of God, if we know that the word of God is true, like Jesus said to the Pharisees, blessed are you who knowing these things does them. And in James, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So if we, if we are taking the word of God lightly, your walk with, with Jesus will be a very light walk, like gossamer. It'll, it'll float away. And so we need to be very, very mindful of what the scripture says about how we should be. If, if I was to ask a question now, could, who, who here could tell me what the nine fruit of the Spirit are? I could test you. <laughs> most, people, most people know about the fruit of the Spirit, but we don't know what the fruit of the Spirit is that we should be demonstrating. And so in, in Galatians, he makes some very profound statements. Chapter 5, verse 19 to 26. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I don't think that's difficult to understand either. That's very clear. Verse 22, he gives the opposite. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, now, now listen to this, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. 
In other words, you can be in the Spirit, but not walk according to the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because of that passage in Peter that says, what sort of persons ought you to be? And, and we, can, we can make the mistake of waking up in the morning and just carrying on with our life. Think about this, think about that, but leave God to one side, neglect the word, and we, we still maintain our title as Christians. But we're not living like Christians. I think if, if, the, if the number of people in the world today that were living as Christians, the world would be a completely different place. Completely different place. And so we need, we need to take it very serious as to how we should be as Christians, as God's representatives here on earth. Paul tells us in Corinthians that we are his ambassadors. We are his representatives here on this earth. What sort of people ought we to be? Matthew 5, 13 to 16. Jesus says, you, talking to his believers, you are the, are the salt of the earth. We are the salt of the earth. He says, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a light cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So what are the good works? What are the good works that, that we need to show the world that they might glorify our Father in heaven? If you don't know what those good works are, how are you going to do them? So the, the, the Bible gives a whole heap of instructions as to how we should be, how, what we should be doing. You know, in, in Psalm 37, dwell in the land and do good. That's not difficult to grasp. Do good. Think good. Speak good. And better grammar than that. Speak good. I, that was for Afshin and, and Mary's and uh, Saint Shalane's benefit. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain it later. <laughs> Let your light so shine before men. You cannot hide your light under a bushel. You know, I, I, I know Christians and have known for a long time. They say, well, I'm just a, a, a private Christian. I'm just, you know look after myself, keep myself. That's not what a Christian is. A Christian is here to let the light shine before men so that they can see your good works and glorify your Father that is in heaven. That's our function. That's our role. That's our responsibility. But if I don't know what the good works are, what I'm supposed to be doing, if I don't know how I'm supposed to be as a Christian, how am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? And you'll only find it in the Word of God. You shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. I, I honestly believe that, um, you know, if we, if we were to read the word of God more frequently with a, with a heart's desire to understand it and get to know Jesus better, not just so that we can have head knowledge, he transforms us into his image. And, and he does it slowly. That's the problem, isn't it? It's slow. We want it now. Oh, God, sanctify me immediately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work like that it does not work like that you know I, I remember a passage in the Old Testament where God says to the, the Israelites that have come out of Egypt he said I will not drive the enemy from before you immediately for you would not be able to bear it now I, I don't know what that says to you but I, and I don't know why it is that they couldn't bear it. But I think I've got a sneaky suspicion it's to do with the fact that if, if we don't have battles to overcome, we become weak. You know, like a lot of the kings in the Old Testament. They served God until they became strong. This, this nation of Australia, we were founded on Christian principles. We were founded on the word of God. The word of God, we always started our 
council meetings, government meetings, um, with, with a prayer, our Father. We don't do that anymore. God, God has been taken out of society, right, left, and center. And we, the church, are responsible for it, whether we like it or not. And it, it's, it, we, we have to develop that heart of repentance before God. God, I'm sorry, I, I haven't lived like I should. I haven't spoken to people as I should. I haven't thought about things that I should. You know, the Bible says so much about the mind because everything starts up here, where we think. The more we think on something, the more likelihood there is that we will do it. And so we need the word of God to keep the salt seasoned. We need the word of God to keep the light shining. You know, in, in Psalms, it says his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It shows us where our next step is, but it's given us our destination. It should be lighting the way for us. We're not just individuals in the body of Christ. We are all parts of the body, all parts of the body of Jesus Christ. We all have a role to play. We all have a function that we must, must uh, do. <clears throat> Sorry, I feel I'm rushing this a little bit, but I, I just want to spend a little bit extra time in worship today. In 2 Timothy 2, 20 to 26, this is so important. This is so important. How many of you discuss doctrine on Facebook? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. If you want to, if you want to see some terrible examples of the body of Jesus Christ, discuss doctrine on Facebook. The language, the insults, and it just it blows my mind. It really does. The only reason that I do it is to try to set an example. Now, I don't claim to be the, the be-all and end-all in, in doctrine or theology, but I do know how to conduct myself because I've read the Word of God. I know what it demands of me. No matter what I'm feeling, no matter what I'm thinking, I mean, many times I've typed, uh, delete, delete, delete. Can't, can't do that. Can't say that. And, I, and I, at that time, I asked God's forgiveness for thinking it. For thinking it. That's all. You know, David said, let the, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And so we have to examine ourselves, test ourselves to see if we're actually living the faith. Are we a hearer of the word but not a doer? We, we have to keep check on ourselves. In 2 Timothy, Paul, Paul writes in verse 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver. Now, I'm assuming this is God's house. There are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. How many have been in a, a, a dispute, you know, even in the last few weeks or so? Just this argument. This, Arguments are stupid. They really are. They don't achieve anything. That's why it's called foolish and ignorant disputes. Don't argue over things that are inconsequential. And even with very important things, don't argue about it. If you start arguing, you're actually disobeying what you're trying to represent. It's a very, it's, it's, because of our human nature, it's very difficult for us to walk away from an argument. When you, even if you know that you're right, even if you know that you're right, walk away. It's not worth it. I remember that quote, I can't remember who it was, but he, he said, I'd rather lose an argument and keep a friend than win an argument and lose a friend. And that's, that's so important. We have to conduct ourselves in a Christ-like manner, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord, that's us, yes? Servant of the Lord must not quarrel. 
but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Next time you, have a, you, you feel yourself getting into an argument with somebody, and you just want to make your point, you want to get your point across, just remember, you've just been taken captive by the devil. Remember that. Because we, we, we're going against the word of God. And we cannot go against the word of God and prosper. You know, what? One of, one of our weaknesses as human beings is this propensity that we must be right. We must be right, and we must be seen to be right. Jesus didn't worry about that. He preached the truth. If they accepted it, fine. If they didn't, fine. He would just sow the seeds. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to sow the seeds of righteousness. And it's not just about going, going out and telling somebody about Jesus Christ. And we've got to show them Jesus Christ. They have to see Christ in us. We are his light. We are his salt. We are his representatives, his ambassadors. We are his children. We are his bond servants. Bond servants. And so we have to realize our lives have got to be lived according to the word of God. And if we don't know it, how are we going to do that? In Matthew 6, 9 to 15, these are just some things that as Christians we should be doing. We should be doing it. In this manner, therefore, pray. Now, we all know this. We all know this prayer. But, and I don't think, I don't think it's word for word that we've got to pray the prayer. You know, it's not like a legalistic thing. But the principles within this prayer, are we actually doing it? And he says, in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, you could, have, you could write a sermon on that. Hallowed be your name, the name of God. How many names do we know of God in the Old Testament that represent his character? You know, we should know these things. We should know them. We should know who God is. We should know about his name and the, Jesus Christ, the name above all names, the name to which every man, every knee, every spiritual principality and power will bow to Jesus Christ. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How often do we pray that? Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And, and I would suggest, if you're anything like me, I, I would suggest that sometimes you go to God and you say, God, not my will, but your will be done. But you go off and do what you wanted to do. I, I remember when I was a young Christian, this, this was profound for me. I was praying. I was just praying and... Um, I don't know what I was praying about, but I remember I was praying, and I said, amen, and I got up to walk away, and I had this vision, this picture in my head of God on his throne going, you don't get that, do you? You get it? I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, but I wasn't waiting for his answer. And so I went, I went about doing what I wanted to do. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Give us our daily bread. We, we, is he talking about food? Is he talking about food there? Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. I don't think he's talking about physical food there. I think he's talking about give us this day our daily bread. Now I'm going to share something with you in a minute that's a little bit technical and but it clarifies some of this a little bit. So give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we, as we forgive our debtors. Do we do that? Do we harbor any grudges against anybody? Do we hold unforgiveness against anybody? We need, we need to search our hearts and say, God, if there's something in there, I want to get rid of it. I want to dispatch it. I don't want it interfering with my relationship with you. 
And he, then he goes uh, in verse 13. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That, that's a pretty strong motivation, is it not? Yeah? Yeah? How many of you want your sins forgiven? Well, you can't go to God and say, oh God, forgive me this, if you're holding resentment or unforgiveness against a brother or a sister or anybody. And so we must, we must understand the whole context of this. And, and if I could point out, I, I think I've shared this once before some moons ago. But in the Greek, in the Greek language, they have a, what they call a personal pronoun that they, they don't put in because it is assumed by the end. Anybody that's got a European language would understand this. You'd understand it, Dolores. Yeah, yes, you, yes, you will. Like feminine, feminine, masculine nouns, they have different endings. They have a different um, um, definite article, like le and la, uh, si, uh, no, not si. Well, you know. You don't know, but... They know. <laughs> they know. So anybody that speaks French would understand that, that the endings incorporate the, the, the pronoun, like he or she. Okay? So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this as I see it written in the Greek. Okay? When it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you give us this day our daily bread... You give us this day our daily bread. And you forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And you do not lead us into temptation. I, th I think if anybody just stops and thinks about that, lead, asking God, lead, lead us not into temptation. Since when does God lead people into temptation? In James it says that God tempts no man. Okay? So that doesn't make sense to say... Lead us not into temptation. It says, you lead us not into temptation. They, they've omitted the, the personal pronoun. But you deliver us from the evil one. See, he's asking, he's, he's saying, oh God, deliver us from the evil. No, I've been delivered from the evil one. Have you? So we're not asking him to do something. We're affirming that he has already done it. Yeah? Yeah? Now, if, if we don't understand that, we, we can have a whole wrong concept of how God interacts with us with these things. And he says, for yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, this is so important. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, this, this passage came up some, a few weeks ago in Matthew 16, 18. These are things we should be doing as Christians. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Um, I'd love to go into that because it's not Peter that's the rock. In the Greek language, it makes it abundantly clear that the rock is the confession that Jesus Christ is the, the Christ. That's, that's the rock. Peter is not the rock. In the Greek language, Peter is Petros, whereas rock is Petra. So this is what the passage actually says. It says, um, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against... No, sorry. And I also say to you that you are Petros. But on this Petra, it's a completely different word in the Greek. So he's saying, he's saying you're, you're this little pebble. But on this rock, this confession that Jesus... Because that's how Jesus builds his church. He builds his church when people confess that he is the Christ. So it's very important that we, we see the subtleties of the, of the language that God has used to give us the Holy Scriptures. And he, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We do the binding. We do the loosing. Why? Remember the message a couple of weeks ago? Because he has given us all authority. 
But how many of us exercise that authority? You know, I, I, I hope this is challenging. I hope you're not liking this. Because it's hard. It's hard work. It's discipline. That's why we're called disciples. We are to be disciplined in following Jesus Christ. He's the master. We are the servants. So whatever he says, we do. God tells me to jump. I don't say, why? I say, how high, Lord? We've got, we've got to restore this relationship between God and his people in our time. You know, the church has drifted so far away from its relationship with God that it's just become mechanical. It's just become a, an organization or an institution, a, a set of belief systems. That's not the body of Jesus Christ. We are a living, a living being in Christ. He is the head, we are the body. So we've got to keep in touch with the head. What does the head say about all this? And then we have to be doers. Um, just one, one last thing that we, we know is in the scriptures. If we're his disciples, we should be doing this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean everywhere you go, you've got to be praying? I, I, I don't think so. It depends how you view prayer. Uh, you know, I, when I pray, I, I have different types of prayer. Some prayers are, are supplications. Some prayers are asking him, you know, to do something for somebody else. Or, but, but generally, I talk to him. I just talk to God. That's, that's prayer. That's also prayer. And we should all be talking to him all the time. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. Does that seem difficult? Yes, it is difficult. You try and, you try and keep your thoughts focused for more than a minute. Or make that 20 seconds. No, I'm serious. You, you know it and I know it. My prayer, when I, when I have my prayers of praying for people, I... I I can normally, if I, if I get a run on, I can normally pray it in 20 minutes. If, I, if I'm not disciplined in bringing my thoughts into captivity, it'll take me 45 to an hour because I keep drifting off somewhere and I'm thinking about this, oh, and get back to where I was. And I just, I, I just thank God that he, he knows. He knows our frame. He knows how weak we are. Doesn't excuse it. But I have to keep disciplining myself to bring my thoughts into captivity, into the obedience of Jesus Christ. And that's a discipline. It's hard work. It's hard work, but it's essential. If we want to, to be Christ's ambassadors, we have to do it his way. You know that song, my way or the byway? My way or the byway? It's his way or the byway. Okay, finally, finally, this is my first finally. And my last, my last, I think. In Romans 12, 1 to 2, you know all these verses. You know these verses. Romans 1, uh, 12, 1 to 2. I beseech you, therefore, that is, that is a very strong word in the Greek language. I beseech you, I beg you, I plead with you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. After what he's done for us, it is more than reasonable that we give ourselves to him. We are a living sacrifice. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? The word of God, it renews our thinking. It makes us think the way Jesus thinks. Now, it's, it's a miracle. To me, it's a mystery how God does this. I think Paul talks about a, a mystery that, that somehow he conveys to us. He gives us revelation. And you know and I know that knowing something, knowing something um, intellectually, it's not nearly as powerful as when God reveals something to you as a revelation. 
And I believe that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And I believe that those rewards is greater revelation of himself. That's one of the prayers I, I pray for you guys, that God would open the eyes of our understanding and give us a greater revelational knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because if we get a greater revelational knowledge of Jesus Christ, everything falls into place. The closer we get to him, the more like him we become. And that's in, I think it's in the Proverbs. We become like the company we keep. If we're, if we're thinking about God all the time, we pray without ceasing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, Paul said in Philippians. How do you rejoice when things aren't going too well? You know, I think of what, what Augustine's been through in the last two years, more, really, isn't it? What, what Augustine's been through in the last couple of years. And he still rejoices in the Lord, just doesn't complain, doesn't moan and groan. You know, one of the reasons most of the Israelites didn't get into the promised land because they complained all the time. You can't be grateful while you're complaining. And so we, we need to look through the scriptures. And you, if you see something, circle it and go back to it. Remind yourself of it. Let it become part of you. You know, I find that the, the greatest way I hear from God is if I'm going to do something, say something or whatever, there, there's a, a scripture that will come to mind that will remind me. Can't say that. Can't do that. You know, one of the, the clearest time I ever heard God speak to me. Sorry, it, it just still it just still brings tears to my eyes when I when I remember it, because it, it was it was audible. It was I, I don't know whether it was audible, but it was audible to me. And this is what he said to me. He said, "No." And that's how he said it. It was. A sharp, get, get, you got my attention, believe me. And I didn't. I didn't. And, and sometimes, sometimes when we're going through life, we get this thought. You know, where um, Charles was saying that, that, that testimony from Samantha. You know, I, I had this gut feeling. That's not a gut feeling. It's a spiritual feeling. It's God speaking to us. You know, he's, he's trying to direct us and talk to us all the time. But because that we have not got the word of God within us, renewing our mind, thinking more about heavenly things than earthly things, we, we miss it. We just miss it. I do believe God speaks to us all the time, but we don't hear it. So, just to, to wind up, finally, just to wind up, what sort of persons ought we to be? Ask yourself that question. What sort of person should we be in holy conduct and godliness? Just because the world does certain things doesn't mean that we have to respond in like manner. You can't overcome evil with evil. And in, in this time of, of disturbance that we're having in our communities, where, where the devil is very clever. Remember, it's a war between good and evil. This is nothing other than a war between good and evil. It, at a time like this, the devil is looking to see, prowling around like a roaring lion to see who he could devour. And he, he whispers to us, he whispers in our ear, he said, don't, you can't let them get away with that. And you say, I rebuke that. I can't let them get away with that. I'm not going to enter into a foolish and ignorant dispute. You know, the fact that we, we have this need to be right and, and to be seen to be right is pride. It's nothing short of pride. And so if we want to be living in the humility of Jesus Christ, we've got to be like Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the, the Son of God, the creator of the universe, allows himself to be hung on a tree and abused to de the degree that I can only begin to imagine? And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The world today, and sadly, the bulk of the church has got no idea what is going on in the world. We've got no idea. We don't learn from history. You know, somebody once said, history ignored is history repeated. And we just keep going round and round in circles in the book of Judges, Distant from God, repent because they're going through tough times. God forgives them, restores them, 
then they do what's right in their own eyes. It's the same cycle over and over again. And we as believers have got to see that. We've got to look beyond what's going on in the natural realm and ask ourselves, what is going on in the spiritual realm? Why is this happening to us? Is God trying to get our attention? And I tell you, folks, the best way to, to, to find out what God's saying, you read the word of God. He'll, he'll direct you somewhere. You know, I'm not, I'm not advocating for, oh, you know, open the Bible, see where it turns up and read there. Oh, God's talking to me. But sometimes, sometimes God can do that. I don't think it's his prime um, agenda, you know, for us to do this. But he can do it. He can show us stuff. If our heart is really seeking, God, I want to know the truth. I want to know the truth. I want to live according to your truth because it's knowing the truth that sets you free. Not the truth itself. You have to know it. So I just encourage you what sort of persons ought we to be in, in holy conduct and godliness. Read your Bible. It tells us very clearly. And will it affect your flesh? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. My battle, my battle is not with the devil. He's defeated. My battle is not with life and death because I know where I'm going. My battle is with me. I'm my own worst enemy. Dying to self, crucifying the flesh. And we have to see that. Don't, don't be looking out there for the problems. Look, look in here. You know, men of God like John Huss and uh, you know, some of the, the martyrs over the, the church age. My, John Huss, I don't know if you're aware of it, but they, they burned him on a stake. And as he was burning, he singing praises to God. What a testimony. I don't fear death. I really don't. I don't fear death one I or I do have a little bit of concern about being burned at the stake or, or perhaps, you know, it, it's not something I say, bring it on, Lord. You know, but, but at the same time, I know that whatever happens, God will sustain me. God will give me his grace to, to go through something. I do believe that the martyrs were given the, a grace of God. That's why they get a martyr's crown. They've, you know, they've, they've been prepared to die, literally, for the gospel, for Jesus Christ. So we've got nothing to fear. As Christians, we've got nothing to fear. As long as we keep in touch with him. As long as we're tuned in to what he's doing. Nothing's changed in the world. Nothing's changed. You know, that first passage we read in Peter, he says right from the beginning of creation, this has been going on. So rest assured, rest assured that if you love Jesus, you just keep building your relationship with him. Do not neglect him. Do not fall for the trap of apathy or, you know, I, I think there's a proverb about it, a little, a little laying, a little sleep, a little slumber. You know, we, we, we fall asleep on the job. And we have to wake ourselves up and realize that we're here for a purpose. Father, we do pray that you would help us. Help us, Lord God, to, to be good representatives of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you for a greater outpouring of your spirit. Lord, help us to identify and recognize when you're doing something with us and through us and in us. So, Lord, this, this morning, as we're meeting for the first time in such a long time, we recommit ourselves to you, and we affirm, Lord God, that we are yours. We belong to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let his spirit fill your soul. Let
Spirit fill your soul.